Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Yehuda Sarna. I serve as one of the university chaplains here, as well as uh, the director of the Bronfen Center for Jewish Student Life at NYU. Uh, there could be uh, uh, no more of an important time than now uh, to discuss what we are going to tonight. Uh, in fact, uh, the headlines in the New York Times just um, 10 days ago, Jordan unabashed announces the latest uh, bombing raid on I ISIS targets. Clearly, uh, Jordan has entered a, uh, a new stage in its engagement with the issues of the region. And of course, what we're here to discuss tonight is the issue of refugees. I wanted to welcome a number of people and give a, a, a few thanks before uh, we proceed. One, I wanted to welcome uh, a class uh, on multi-faith leadership in the 21st century. Imam Khaled Latif, who's the other university chaplain, and I teach a class. And one of, our, uh, one of the things we try to teach uh, in multi-faith leadership is the importance of storytelling, of narrative, because we find that more than facts, uh, it is story that motivates action. And, um, and uh, as I think about great activists and I think about uh, great storytellers, our panelists tonight uh, meet both criteria. I wanted to thank uh, a number of people who are here first, and some people, one person who is not here, Hilary Ballin, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of NYU Abu Dhabi, uh, who is uh, our, our proud host tonight. Uh, so I just wanted to thank Hillary. She might see the video recording, um, even though she's not here in presence. I also wanted to thank uh, Kate Panuska, who's the events and program manager, uh, who put together uh, much of this evening. So uh, maybe a round of applause for Kate. Thank you. I also wanted to thank uh, some of the staff of the Multi-Faith Alliance, which you'll hear more about in just a few minutes. Uh, who are here, Rabbi Eric Greenberg, uh, Alison Zakharoff. I also wanted to thank uh, Sigal Neustein from my staff who, who worked on tonight's event. I wanted to welcome uh, Mark and Anita Sarna, two great activists, not, 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 not a actually blood relatives so closely to me, though I'm convinced, convinced that, we are, uh, that we are related. Um, I wanted to welcome some uh, local community rabbis here, here, Rabbi Larry Siebert, and there, there might, in fact, be others. I also wanted to welcome the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, some spouses who are here. Lady Sachs has recently joined Rabbi Sachs here on this side of the ocean. And uh, Mr. Leonard Polonsky, who's, who's here as well. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, so with all the uh, activists, religious leaders, scholars who are here tonight, I feel like this is, yes, it's an event, but uh, it also feels a bit like a working meeting. And certainly the urgency is there. So without any further ado, I wanted to welcome our two panelists, uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the Rennert Global Distinguished Professor of Judaic Thought at NYU, Dr. Jo Georgette Bennett, President and, f and Founder of the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding and the founder now of the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees, Rabbi Sachs. Um. Friends, it's an enormous privilege to join you in this wonderful setting of uh, NYU and Rabbi Sana and the Interfaith Leadership Program, but to say in particular how privileged I feel to be sharing this platform with Dr. Georgia Bennett, who has been not just a distinguished academic, uh, broadcaster, lecturer, and author, but also for your incredible work, Georgia, founding and leading the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding for the past 23 years and for this incredible humanitarian initiative so seriously needed. Friends, uh, let me just say what I'm going to do. Uh, when, the Harvard, so, when the Harvard scholar Daniel Bell spent a sabbatical in the London School of Economics, they asked him, uh, Professor Bell, what do you specialize in? And he replied, I specialize in generalizations. <laughs> so I'm going to deal with the generalizations, and then Dr. Bennett will speak about the specifics of the Syrian crisis. Um, let me just, therefore, set out what I see as the three theological principles at stake here, and then the three actual biblical commands that address our situation. Number one, I think it is a tremendously uh, 
powerful statement that links the Abrahamic monotheisms, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and obviously has echoes elsewhere. But when Genesis 1 tells us at the beginning, at the outset, that um, when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, it was making a political and moral statement that every single human being, regardless of class, color, culture, or creed, has a non-negotiable dignity. God has set his image on each one of us, and therefore every human life is holy. Every human life is something we have a duty to save if we can. Every human life has dignity. The second appears almost immediately with the first two human children, Cain and Abel, the first sibling rivalry, the first fratricide, the first murder. And God challenges Cain. And Cain replies, am I my brother's keeper? To which the answer has to be yes. We really are. We're responsible not only for ourselves, but everyone we could save or could protect. So the principle number two is we are each our brother and sister's keepers. Our responsibility extends beyond ourselves to those of our fellows whom we can help. And thirdly, a thing that has enormous importance in Judaism, and you'll find in Genesis chapter 9, is the covenant God makes with Noah and through him with all humankind. And that tells us that there is a covenant of human solidarity, which transcends all borders and boundaries. The Bible is telling us that our common humanity precedes and supersedes our religious differences. We are all vulnerable. We are all dependent on one another. And therefore, we must reach out the arm to help one another. Those are the three generalities. Three commands that I think are extremely significant. One we just read in the synagogue a week or two back. And that, oh, no, actually, we read it last week. Um, if you see your enemy's ox crouching under its burden, help him unload it. Now, there are not a lot of overladen oxen on the streets of New York, I've noticed. It's probably too cold for them. But it's very interesting what the Bible is doing here. We know that Christianity set a very high bar. Love not only your neighbor, but also your enemy. Judaism pitches it a little lower, but perhaps uh, to a certain extent a little more realistically. We, don't com we are not commanded to love our enemy, but we are commanded to help our enemy. Because that is one of the ways we overcome the hostility between us. There's your enemy. He's got a flat tire. Um, you know, you've got to help him out because he is nonetheless also God's image. Even if you don't like him and he doesn't like you, nonetheless, help him. And I think that principle of helping your enemy is a very practical way in which we can overcome some hostilities that might have existed otherwise. And of course, Dr. Bennett is going to give us a real life, current, present tense example of that. The second one, which you'll find in Leviticus 19, is lo ta'amod al damre'echa, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor which a great Holocaust historian translates as, thou shalt not be a bystander. When you see bad happening in the world, don't just stand there and say, this doesn't concern me. It does. Don't be a bystander. Don't stand idly by. And in a wonderful series of quick vignettes, the Bible paints the picture of the young Moses. I haven't actually seen the film. Uh, have you seen the film? Um, the Scott Ridley, Ridley Scott film? Uh, you're probably wise because the people who have told me the book is better. <laughs> uh, but we see these three vignettes of the young adolescent, really, Moses. First he sees an Egyptian taskmaster beating a member of his people, a Hebrew, and he intervenes. Then the next day he sees two Jews arguing. Why does this not surprise any of us? It's what we do for a living. And again, he intervenes. And then 
he has to escape from Egypt because his life is in danger. And he sees some shepherds manhandling uh, the daughters of the Midianite priest Jethro, and again he intervenes. Now these three stories are actually beautifully structured because one is non-Jew assaulting a Jew. If we only saw that, we would say Moses is a chauvinist. He's loyal to his people, but he doesn't really concern himself with others. If we only saw him intervening between two Jews, again, we'd say he's interested in justice for his people and reconciliation, but doesn't engage with the world outside. But the third is non-Jew against non-Jew, and again, he intervenes. What this tells us is Moses' sense of justice transcends the particularity of his identity as a Hebrew, as an Israelite. And therefore, Moses' life is a role model in don't be a bystander. When you see injustice, intervene. And finally, the command, which according to the Bible, uh, appears 36 times in the Mosaic books. We're told once, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. We're told once, love your neighbor as yourself. But we are told in one form or another 36 times, love the stranger. Because once you were a stranger, you know what it feels like to be a stranger. And that specifically means reach out and help people who are not like you. And that is absolutely fundamental. So therefore, let me end just by um, the, a very simple story, perhaps two little stories about people who inspired me. One of them tragically died young at the age of 52 after a terrible accident just a year ago. She lived here in New York. Her name was Anne Heyman. I don't know if any of you knew her. And uh, you remember Anne was watching television in 2004, watching a documentary on the plight of Rwandan orphans 10 years on after that massacre in which 800,000 Tutsis and their friends were murdered in the space of 100 days, one of the worst massacres in history. And of course, it left a lot of orphans, and she was seeing this television documentary, seeing how difficult it was for them, and she said to herself, this is the story she told me, she said she was watching this television program, and she was thinking, I'm a Jew, I'm supposed to do something not just supposed to watch, I'm supposed to do something. Now she knew that Israel, after the Holocaust, had to deal with a lot of orphans. And they built a lot of youth villages. So she got in touch with them and the JDC, the joint here in New York, and they built a youth village in Rwanda called the Agohozo Shalom Youth Village and provided housing and a little home for 750 Rwandan orphans, asking only of them that they taught them leadership, computer skills, how to grow avocados, all this kind of thing. And said, you know, the only thing we ask of you is hand on those leadership skills to the people you meet. Go and uh, do likewise to others. Pay it forward, as it says in the film. And that was Anne. Now that's a big thing. You may think none of us can do something that big. And therefore I love this story told by somebody called Stephen H Carter, who's a law professor at Yale right now, Stephen Carter uh, was uh, 11 years old when he and his family, a black family, became the first black family to move into a hitherto all-white neighborhood in Washington. And he tells the story of what it felt like to arrive there. He said, I and my sister sat on the front step of the house the first, day, the first morning after our arrival to see how we would be welcomed. We weren't. Nobody even looked at us. And I remember thinking, we will never belong here. We should never have come here. And then uh, a lady at the other side of the street passed by, her hands laden with shopping. And she turned towards us, and she saw us and gave us a big smile, disappeared in her house, came out five minutes later with a big tray full of drinks and cookies, and came over to us and said, welcome, it's so wonderful to have you here. He said, that day changed my life and taught me that I could belong. He said... Uh, it's not surprising that Sarah Kestenbaum was a religious Jew because there's, Jews have a word for this kind of thing. They call it chesed, which means kindness, especially to strangers, especially when it's hard. Now Sarah, who also died young, 
could never have known that what, that one act changed a young man's life and allowed him to feel at home enough to go and become a professor of law at Yale. I'm sure there are higher things in life, but that seems pretty high to me. So one simple act of kindness can change someone's world. And if a single life is like a universe, something we believe across the Abrahamic faiths, then the way to change the universe is simply to change a life. May God allow us to change someone's life for the good. And now I cede the floor to someone who has saved many lives. Thank you. Well, you set that up beautifully. Thank you. A couple of thank yous before I get going. First of all, to Judah Sarna. Um, very grateful that you've set up this wonderful program for us today. Uh, Rabbi Sarna, um, who, in addition to heading the Bronchman Center, also heads um, or co-heads uh, the Of Many program, which is so extraordinarily important in terms of building bridges. And um, also in terms of building bridges, uh, we're very privileged to have Rabbi Lord Sachs um, here at NYU for the year, and I'm delighted to be back home because this is where I got my PhD decades and decades ago. I've lost count of just how many. But um, Rabbi Sachs, in my world, is a rock star. So I feel extraordinarily privileged to be sharing this program with him. Uh, in the interfaith world, um, Rabbi Sachs has been an enormous voice, an, uh, an eloquent voice of reason, um, of depth. He's written wonderful books. My favorite is The Dignity of Difference. And um, what shines through in him is his extraordinary humanity. So we just received uh, a very good sermon here, or a Devar Torah, as, as Jews would say, um, which lays the foundation for Jewish giving and Jewish response to situations like the one that we're going to talk about tonight. So I'd like to first lay out for you what the parameters of this crisis are, and then just to take a minute about what motivated this particular Jew to respond to it. It's fair to say that what we're looking at in terms of the Syrian crisis is the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II, and it is one that is growing exponentially. Each time I talk about this, the numbers change. So within a couple of months, they're always out of date because things are getting so much worse. But as of today, we have more than 12 million people who are in need of humanitarian aid inside Syria. Inside Syria. Now, just to contextualize this for you, that is larger than the population of Sweden, or Hungary, or Greece, or Portugal, and it is more than half the population of Syria itself. Within that more than 12 million, you have 7.6 million who were internally displaced. Then you have nearly 4 million refugees who have fled Syria, and tens of thousands of those are unregistered, so we don't even know what the real number is. There have been 135,000 applications for asylum just last year, and yet the resettlement process, for a variety of reasons, is extraordinarily slow. The U.S. resettled. Would you like to take a, a guess how many the U.S. resettled last year? 158. 1.3 billion dollars is needed in order to help alleviate this crisis, but only 60% of the pledges that have been made toward that have been paid. 
In terms of the refugees, 80% of those live outside refugee camps. Now, what does that mean? That means that they are what are called urban refugees, that they are scattered among cities, living often in isolation, extraordinarily vulnerable, often unregistered, which means they are not eligible for services, they are not eligible for resettlement. 80% of the refugees are women and children. 50% of those are children, and 30% are children under 12. Now, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what it means for 30% of a population of this size to be made up of children who are under 12 years old, and what that means for the future and what that means in terms of a lost generation of children. There have been 200,000 people killed in Syria through a combination of techniques, chemical weapons, barrel bombs, torture, and even medical facilities and medical workers are being attacked as a weapon of war. And this is one of the most pernicious aspects of what's going on there, to attack medical personnel and facilities as a weapon of war because they are considered to be traitors, because they are treating people who were wounded, and some of those people who were wounded may be members of the opposition. So, why did I decide to respond? Noah, can you come up? We're going to do this. Well, in terms of a theological basis, I personally was motivated by Leviticus, which was cited by Rabbi, thank you, Rabbi Sachs in his opening remarks. That is, that thou shalt not stand by idly, in my case, while the blood of your neighbor cries out from the earth. There are a lot of translations of Leviticus 19.16, but that's the basic message. And this is something else that motivated me. These are not photographs of concentration camps during the Holocaust. These are photographs of torture victims in Syria. And this is happening right now. Now, I happen to be a child of Holocaust survivors. And um, my parents and I were refugees. If you were to look at the passenger manifest that brought us over to America after we escaped Hungary, then you would have seen that in the column where the nationality needs to be written in the passenger manifest, our nationality next to our names said stateless. So, I understand something about dislocation, and I understand something about rootlessness, and I understand something about what we are commanded to do as Jews. And so I felt compelled to organize a response, and I started first by speaking to Alan Gill, who is the uh, CEO of the Joint Distribution Committee, which uh, Rabbi Sachs also referenced earlier. And together we organized something called the Jewish Coalition for Syrian Refugees in Jordan. And some months later, that was scaled up to the Multi-Faith Alliance for, for Syrian Refugees. And what the Multi-Faith Alliance does, 
is harness and mobilize the moral authority of religious actors and religious institutions to address this horrific tragedy. Because while there are lots of humanitarian aid organizations and there are lots of political organizations, there is something very special about mobilizing the moral authority of religion. It's not only moral authority. When you think about it, religious institutions also come with vast constituencies that they can mobilize. And they also come with very sophisticated communication networks, which they can utilize. So there are very practical things here, apart from the God talk. There are real resources that religious institutions can bring to the table. So we now have 38 member organizations, some of them secular, by the way. But they want to be identified with this effort. And what we do is we raise awareness and we raise funds to support organizations that are working on the ground, providing direct assistance to refugees. But there's something very interesting that has come out of this work. And it's something that is a glimmer of hope coming out of this awful, awful, unfathomable tragedy. And here's what it is. Among the organizations that have applied to the Jewish Coalition and to the Multi-Faith Alliance for, um, for funds to do their work are some Israeli organizations. So one of the great unknown stories here is the humanitarian aid that both the Israeli government and Israeli NGOs are providing. Out of, out of that, as Syrians have encountered Israelis who have been there to help them, out of that have emerged partnerships between Syrians and Israelis who were working together to alleviate this terrible human suffering. And out of those partnerships of working together, their ability to rise above politics to alleviate human suffering is a track to diplomatic channel between Israeli and Syrian civil society actors. Now talk about something counterintuitive. If these enemies, Syria and Israel, can rise above politics to work together in a situation like this, then I think there is hope for every sectarian conflict anywhere in the world. And if, in fact, this gains traction, this could change the equation in the Middle East. So that's the message out of, out of something as terrible as this, that this kind of hope can emerge. So with that, I'll close my opening presentation. And I think that Rabbi Sachs and I are just going to be having a conversation now. So um, can I just ask you a personal question? How much did you feel driven by your own memories and your own pain on this one? I felt very much driven by that. Um, I've actually been on the board of the International Rescue Committee for 22 years mm. because of that. And um, the International Rescue Committee is probably the premier refugee uh, assistance and resettlement agency in the world. Mm. That's uh, David Miliband. That's right. Because um, it seems to me there's quite an important message here. You know, how do we use our pain? How do we use our bad memories? I once asked, um, he was then Crown Prince Hassan, um, the brother of the late King Hussein. Yes. It didn't quite work out 
as every, everyone expected. But I, I once went to see him in Amman. And uh, this was just after the assassination of Yitzchak Rabin. And I asked him, Prince Hassan, what will bring us together? Jews and Muslims, Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians. And he said something I thought very moving. He said, our shared tears. And I think, you know, this is telling us something, that you can use your tears and the memories of bad things that happened to you or your family or your people, either to become resentful and want revenge, or to understand from within your pain that this connects you to other people's pain. And I remember, um, was it uh, the late Viktor Frankl, the man who uh, survived Auschwitz and built a whole school of psychotherapy on what he called our search for meaning. And he always used to quote Kierkegaard, the Christian theologian. I'm not sure if Kierkegaard ever said this, because I googled it so many times and I could never find it. But he said, the door to happiness opens outward. In other words, it's by opening ourselves to other people's pain that we can overcome our own. So just talk us through that. Well, it's actually um, an essential part of conflict transformation. Um, and, and I'm familiar with what you said about Prince Hassan. He's, he's on the Tannenbaum Center's Leadership Council. And He's, a, he's been an extraordinary force in interfaith relations. But the first step in transforming any conflict before it can be resolved is to acknowledge the pain of the other. And also to acknowledge the ways in which each side has hurt the other. Once you've done that, you can move on to the next steps in terms of conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. I think that's really fundamental. And I want to just share with you whether you, you wouldn't agree with another fundamental, which is it's at moments like this when we're helping people out and we're not really thinking who's one of us and who isn't one of us, that we actually overcome all those things that sometimes cause us to dehumanize other people. I remember when uh, the war in Kosovo was going on in 1999 and there were about 300,000 mainly Muslim refugees in Macedonia and the Israelis sent out youth groups. No, the Israelis sent out a medical team and the first thing they discovered was no one was looking after the kids. Everyone was focusing on the adults. And there were these hundreds of thousands of kids running wild with no one looking. So they sent over youth groups. And this was the first time many of the Muslims had ever met a Jew and many of the Israelis had ever really met a Muslim. And they got together over soccer. You know, I always thought English have these eccentric inventions, but uh, soccer did help them discover their shared humanity. Do you think that is what's happening between Israelis and Syrians at the moment? That is absolutely what's happening between Israelis and Syrians because it's, it's very true. Well, the Tannenbaum Center did some work um, in Damascus um, a couple of years before the Civil War broke out. And um, the Tannenbaum Center is a non-sectarian organization, but the person who was there doing the trainings we had been invited to do, interestingly enough, to train women in conflict resolution skills was the CEO of the Tannenbaum Center, who is Jewish. And none of those women had ever met a Jew before and had all kinds of images in their minds about what it meant to be a Jew. And as a sociologist, that's my field, one of the things that you, I mean, one of the first things you learn in sociology is what is the most important step in overcoming stereotypes? And the most important step is contact and communication because it's only through that when you have the immediacy of 
the object of your stereotypes in front of you, and they end up not conforming to those stereotypes, that you're able to break down the stereotypes. In the case of, um, of this humanitarian assistance, one of the people with whom we're working, uh, a Syrian refugee and activist, tells the story of why he had to leave Syria. And um, that even that after he left, he decided he was going to devote himself to providing aid to Syrians, refugees, and also inside Syria. And he was doing this because of his son, because when his son was going to ask him years from now, Father, what did you do when our people were suffering? He wanted to be able to say that he did something real to help them. So he was operating in Turkey and Bulgaria and all over the region. And one day somebody came up to him um, and said, I want to introduce you to somebody who wants to help. And he said, of course, we need help anywhere we can get it. And the, the intermediary said, but I need to tell you something. She's Israeli. And he said, Israeli? I mean, what does an Israeli want with me? Is it Mossad? I don't have any information to give them. Um, because he had been brought up for decades, every single day, being told Israel is the enemy, Israelis want to kill all of us, we better kill them before they kill us, uh, Israel wants to take over our land and turn us into refugees the way they turned the Palestinians into refugees, and we need to have a very strong military because we have to be prepared to attack Israel. This is what he had been taught every day of his life. So suddenly, when he was being confronted with the possibility of meeting an Israeli, he said, wait a minute. But then he said, um, okay, I'll talk to her. And he found out that she had no agenda other than wanting to help. And for him, this was uh, an aha moment because he said, wait a minute, it's not Israel that is taking our land and turning us into refugees. It's our own government. It's not Israel that's killing us. It's our own government. So if that's a lie, what else is a lie? Because here's an, is an Israeli who comes with a whole team of Israelis, and they're here to help us. And ever since then, he and this Israeli have been working together, bringing together the Syrian NGOs and the Israeli NGOs, delivering food, delivering the latest thing that, that they are bringing right into Syria, is a 3D printer. Interestingly enough, there was just an article in this Sunday Times magazine about these 3D printers, or maybe it was in uh, today's Times, Science Times yesterday, that's right, 3D printers that print prosthetic devices. Well, as you can imagine, the, the kinds of injuries that there are in Syria there is a great need for prosthetic devices. So this Israeli NGO has delivered these from Israel to the Syrian NGO that is bringing them into Syria. Now that's an extraordinary example of what happens to stereotypes when human beings meet each other, meet each other. I was very interested when you mentioned women were being trained uh, in skills of reconciliation. Um, I'd like to hear from you whether you feel women have a special role here. I, I've been very struck 
uh, within, uh, within the, the Islamic world as I've encountered it, that women seem to be extraordinarily courageous and very often more forward thinking than the men. I suppose they always are, but you know, I'm, I'm a bloke, so uh, I hate admitting it, but you know, there is something within the male that seeks to be the alpha male and goes around hitting any potential competitors. And there is something about the female that tends to embrace and comfort and soothe. Do you think uh, women have a special role now and in, and in the healing work that has to be done in the future? Women absolutely have a special role, but unfortunately, they are often marginalized um, in the peacemaking process and in the reconciliation process. When you think about Northern Ireland, for example, and the intractability of the quote-unquote troubles over decades, um, one wonders whether we ever would have gotten to the, peace, the Good Friday Agreement if the women hadn't taken to the streets um, a decade or two before that. Um, and I think in the, you, you mentioned the Islamic world in particular and how courageous women are when they step forward. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, it can take a great deal of courage. I think one of the things that many people who are not Muslims don't understand is what a radically egalitarian document the Quran is for its time. Um, it is a document that says a great deal about women's rights. And in fact, if you were to go to the Grand Mosque in Oman, which was built by the current Sultan of Oman, Sultan Qaboos, you would see that in the main prayer hall where the inscriptions from the Quran are painted all, all around the rotunda, those are all inscriptions that deal with women's rights. So the kind of oppression of women that we identify with Islam is in fact not a manifestation of Islam. It is a manifestation of the particular cultures in which Islam is practiced. And so that's a cultural um, take on Islam. But there, um, but there is an increasing recognition of the role that women can play. And they do play it very differently than the men. Let me ask you the final question, and then I'll uh, we'll turn it over to the floor. Um, as you know, since you mentioned Northern Ireland, um, let me share with you something. The, the, we, the person who was most active in Britain on, in the peace process in Northern Ireland was Tony Blair. Tony Blair was a very religious man, and uh, his press officer, Alastair Campbell, refused to let him ever speak about his religious beliefs. When any journalist... He's ever, made up for it now. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when any journalist ever asked him about his religious beliefs, Alastair Campbell would intervene and say, we don't do God. Um, so you have this political culture, which is pretty much diametrically opposed to the American political culture, Eisenhower said, a president of the United States has to believe in God, and it doesn't matter which God he believes in. So um, when Tony Blair retired or resigned from being prime minister, I phoned him up because we were reasonably good friends. And I said, Tony, now you're no longer prime minister. You can do God. And I did the first interview for BBC television with Tony Blair after he was prime minister. And he spoke precisely about his religious beliefs, how they affected him and his family. But most interestingly, he spoke about how they had helped him politically. And I asked him, did his religious beliefs help him bring peace to Northern Ireland? And he said, yes, because I was the first politician don't forget Northern Ireland is Catholics against Protestants. I was the first politician who saw religion 
not just as part of the problem, but also as part of the solution. Now, we're dealing here with a world in which religiously motivated violence is a very dark force. Can religion be part of the solution, not just part of the problem? You, above all, uh, are the person whose views I would, I would most like to hear about this. Thank you. Um, and I can respond to that with a resounding yes. Starting with your Northern Ireland example, two of the Tannenbaum Center's peacemakers, uh, Father Alex Reed and Reverend Roy McGee, both of whom unfortunately have died, were very much responsible for the ceasefires that eventually made the uh, Good Friday Agreement possible because Father Reed, who was known as the IRA priest, negotiated the IRA ceasefire, and Reverend McGee negotiated the Loyalist paramilitary ceasefire. And how were they able to do that? They were able to do it in two ways. Number one, they had street creds, because these were not clergy who stayed behind the pulpit. Alex Reed was down there in the streets with the IRA. Same was true of Roy McGee. So they had the street creds. Having the street creds, when each of them said respectively, and by the way, they didn't have much use for each other. Uh, they were not friends. Um, but when each of them went to their own constituencies and said, the violence you are committing violates our religion. You are sinning. They had the credibility to be listened to. And so they were able to negotiate those foundational ceasefires that made the rest possible. And all of the, all of the peacemakers in, in our peacemakers networks are people who are using religion as part of the solution to conflict instead of it always being the cause of conflict. And an initiative that you and I are both involved with, um, the Global Covenant of Religion, I think is the latest kind of proof point of the role that religion can play. Because this is an international initiative being driven at the very highest levels. The Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, important imams, prelates from all over the world. And its, its sole focus is delegitimizing the use of religion as a justification for violence. And so when religious leaders themselves speak up against this, then I think there is real hope. Spoke, um, Dr. Bennett, you spoke earlier about the large majority of urban refugees who are not registered. What are the barriers to being registered, and how would that help a situation? There are, for one thing, cultural barriers to being registered. One of the problems um, with resettlement applications, for example, is that women are not registering in their own names. They register in the name of the senior male member of the family. If you're not registered in your own name, you're not eligible for resettlement. But they're very ashamed of the situation in which they find themselves. And so many don't want to be registered. Others don't want to be registered because of fear. They're concerned that if they are registered and the regime in Syria finds out about that, that their lives will be in even greater danger than they are in anyway. Many choose not to be registered just because they want to be on their own, but if they're on their own, they are very vulnerable. 
Um, in Jordan, for example, and in a number of host countries, it is not legal for refugees to work. But they have to survive, and so they work illegally. And because they're working illegally, they can be, they're, they're subject to exploitation, um, and they have no recourse because they're working illegally. Um, they're also very isolated. Now, in the camps, I've, I've just come back from Jordan, and I've just come back from the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan, which is the second largest refugee camp in the world and is now the fourth largest city in Jordan. And one can see there the benefits to being registered. I was astounded to find all of the businesses that are operating, small businesses operating in the camp. Now, it's true the shops are kind of jerry-rigged and ramshackle, but they are licensed. Syrians are licensed to start small businesses in the camps. And there is an economy there. Um, if you're in the camps, you don't pay taxes, you don't pay rent, you don't pay for water, you don't pay for electricity. Now, that causes enormous resentment among the Jordanians who have to pay for all of these things. But um, I probably answered your question more fully than you wanted it answered, but I think it provides important context. non-political. That doesn't mean that we don't engage with Syrian NGOs, some of which are political, by the way. For example, uh, the Syrian Emergency Task Force uh, and also SAC. But you're quite right that this, this problem is not going to end anytime soon. And we're facing a couple of dangers before, because of that in addition to the obvious dangers to the victims themselves. One of them is that the region is being increasingly destabilized because the refugees are such an enormous drain on the resources of the host countries. Jordan is on the verge of collapse. Lebanon, certainly. Uh, Turkey, uh, is well resourced to handle its refugee population. Um, and Egypt, of course. So you have the threat of increasing regional destabilization. Destabilization because of the drain on infrastructure, the drain on the economies. But the other danger is that because the power vacuums are being filled by extremist groups such as uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and ISIS, that you have that kind of destabilization. But perhaps the most dangerous form of destabilization is what I alluded to earlier, which is the loss of the generation of children who are not being educated, or only a percentage are being educated. And they are going to be very vulnerable to manipulation and radicalization as they get older. And for those who are in the camps, growing up within the confines of a camp and seeing no future because of that, 
will also leave them vulnerable to radicalization and manipulation. For those outside the camps, living on the margins in much the same way that illegal aliens live here in the United States, of course, also leaves people in a state of despair. And if I could just follow, um, it's, it's exactly because of that situation, especially when you're dealing with these children. So I'm just curious, you know, because of your experience, is there any method that is proactive as opposed to reactionary? So we see that this problem is developing and we're just responding to it. Yes. Proactive <coughs> education, education, education. Proactive is at least for those in the camps who were permitted to work, microfinance, <coughs> let them get businesses going. It's very important, um, especially for these populations, to be able to preserve their dignity, to have a sense of purpose. Um, you know, they, they are so humiliated by finding themselves in the situation that they're in. And, and that humiliation is partially a cultural thing because I think, um, I think in the West we would probably not experience our situation as one of humiliation. We would experience it as something else. So it's very important to counter the feeling of humiliation, to reinforce the sense of dignity and the sense of productivity. Um, thank you again so much for, for coming and, and teaching us so much. Um, according to the handout, you men it mentions that there is a structured track to dialogue slash partnership program in development and set to launch this year. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that program and who you envision participating in. Well, um, that program is, is waiting for more funding, but we do have a number of people who were lined up and ready on the Syrian side and on the Israeli side. And um, we also have a very high level one that is uh, ready to roll. And and they are looking at issues like free trade zones and, you know, Syria is going to need a great deal of rebuilding because the infrastructure is destroyed. Um, so that's a little bit about that. The, the idea is, um, is not kumbaya. You know, kumbaya is great, but if you can't turn kumbaya into some action, I don't think it's got a great deal of value. So this is very much focused on action. And what is it that can be done together in partnership? Um, any piggyback on what my classmate was saying? Hi, I'm Hannah, uh, and you're at NYU. Hannah at NYU. Um, and I was just wondering, um, you were talking about how um, one Israeli individual and one motivated Syrian individual coming together um, was maybe the spark of hope for um, uh, a generation of change or continued lasting change. And how, um, just as you were talking about how changing one life um, can change the universe, how we think that taking the motivation of two individuals who chose to work together um, can relate to the communities who aren't as ready to choose and make that step um, to come together, if that makes sense. Do you want to take it? Um, no, I mean, you, you know what it's like, but this is the problem. The problem is that two individuals come together, recognize their shared humanity, and are able to work together. They go back to their respective constituencies who may be laden with uh, dehumanizing stereotypes of the other. And uh, they are then seen as kind of uh, traitors to the cause, if you like, or people who just don't relate to them anymore. And that creates what historically and ethically is the worst paradox of them all, that when it comes to war, even quite ordinary human beings, 
can become heroes. But when it comes to peace, even heroes find it difficult. And it is the peacemakers who tragically get assassinated. I mean, it was Gandhi who was assassinated. It was Martin Luther King. It was Anwar Sadat. It was Yitzhak Rabin. Because peace, though everyone wants peace, nonetheless involves a profound redrawing of boundaries. I thought I knew who I was because this was my world. And now I have to include you who were outside my world within my world. So it's a, almost an identity crisis. And that's the trouble when those remarkable individuals who do come together and transcend those stereotypes return to their respective groups. And this is a real problem, and I'd like your, your experience on that. Well, the other paradox is that crisis forces people together. Because, you know, you can give all the encouragement you want when, when things are normal. And you probably won't get much of a response. But in a crisis situation where people are forced together, then the aha moment is much more likely to happen. Would you describe the situation in the Palestinian territories also as a crisis? And do you then have, like, from the Tannenbaum Center, similar projects there? Because that would be a, a nice thing to establish inter well, uh, interface dialogue. We, um, the Tannenbaum Center has several peacemakers who are involved in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I personally um, have been involved in um, funding through the IRC uh, an education program in uh, Ramallah for two years. Um, I don't see the Syrian crisis and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict the same way at all. But I totally agree with you that there are there certainly are many things that can be done to bring people together. I think, if I can just add to that, um, let me tell you a story where I think things went wrong. And they could have gone so right. There was a point in around 2000 when people in the Middle East came to the conclusion that I mentioned Tony Blair came to that Religion can be part of the solution, not just the problem. And there was a proposal to bring together uh, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish leaders, religious leaders from the area, um, to talk their way through to um, a more open approach to peace once the Oslo process had got stuck in, 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 in the sand. And at that stage, it was Prince Hassan and myself who were asked to uh, request to persuade the then Archbishop of Canterbury, whose name was George Carey, to chair something called the Alexandria Process. It was a very, very funny meeting. We, I mean, it was a good sport. Was, yeah, it was a very good sport. Anyway, he did it. I mean, it was very funny, actually. I mean, I just... <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm just remembering the lunch at Lambeth Palace when we were trying to uh, uh, persuade him because Prince Hassan, after the first course, uh, turned to George Carey. He, he smokes, you know. I don't know if he still does, but he did then. And he said uh, to George Carey, do you mind if I smoke? And George Carey said, well, you'll have to ask my wife, Eileen. <laughs> So he turned this prince, I mean, the prince in wait, king in waiting, turned to Eileen Carey and said, do you mind if I smoke? And she rather frostily said, I think not. <laughs> and Middle East diplomacy was about to uh, get stuck in the sand yet again. So I came up with a little bit of active uh, reconciliation and suggested that if we could get through dessert, we might take a walk 
in the gardens of Lambeth Palace where the prince could smoke to his heart's content. And uh, so we agreed that was the way forward in that particular uh, crisis in negotiations. We then walked around, the three of us, around the garden in Lambeth Palace for an hour. And Prince Hassan was so enthusiastic about the possibilities of bringing peace that he entirely forgot why he went there in the first place and never got around to smoking at all, which was good for his health and good for peace in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, George Carey was a tremendous good sport. And he convened that process in Alexandria and follow-throughs and so on. The real problem was then that these religious peacemaking this religious peacemaking process was not officially recognized as track to diplomacy. So it never connected to anything real politically. So after lots of pain and, and vulnerability, they finally came to this great collective statement, but nobody was listening. And that's what happens if you don't make something track to diplomacy. Because when for people to recognize the humanity of the other. It's painful, it's difficult, and you want to feel that it's had some result. And that means it has to feed into a real political process. And that's why I think you've done the right thing in seeing a real track to uh, a approach that may be activated at some stage so it won't just end in kumbaya. So I think this is really important. You're quite right, Jordan has a long history of um, hosting refugees. There are, Jordan's population is six and a half million. There are still four million Palestinian refugees in Jordan, 200,000 Iraqi refugees, and now according to King Abdullah, 1.4 uh, Syrian, 1.4 million Syrian refugees. I say King Abdullah because the UN HCR numbers are uh, about seven, about half of that. Um, so yes, they have experience dealing with refugees, but make no mistake about it. Um, in Jordan, it is absolutely government run because Jordan is very clear that they don't want to make the mistake that was made, for example, in um, UN-run Palestinian refugee camps. They want to make it absolutely clear that any refugees in Jordan are under Jordan sovereignty. And they exercise this in a number of ways. Now, there's some, um, <laughs> there's some controversy over whether it's UNHCR or whether it's the Jordan uh, S-A-R-D, uh, Syrian Assistance Refugee Department, I think is what that acronym means, that is running the camps. But if you look at things like how the camps are policed, um, Syrians are absolutely not permitted to become police officers in the camps. They've even introduced community policing in the camps, which is a different kind of policing, but Syrians are not permitted to serve in that capacity either because Jordan wants to absolutely maintain sovereignty. Uh, well, if, if I may, just um, before I ask you to make some concluding comments, just uh, remind us of this is a very famous and extraordinary social science experiment, which is, I think, already half a century old, called the Robber's Cave Experiment. Many of you will know about this. Let me just remind you. It was an experiment 
to deal with understand group dynamics and intergroup hostility. Uh, a researcher called Muzava Sharif brought 20 11-year-old kids to a summer camp in a national park called Robbers Cave. And they were there for four weeks. During week one, they were in two groups, and neither group knew of the existence of the other. And that first week, they engaged in bonding experiences, whatever they were. And by the end of the week, they had really bonded each into a strongly team-spirited group. One called themselves the Eagles. The others called themselves the Rattlers. The next week, they were brought together at a single campsite and made to compete day after day for uh, big prizes for the winner, nothing for the loser. Within days, they were hostile to one another. They started by calling each other names in the dining hall. By the end of the week, they were raiding one another's tents, trying to set fire to them, and so on. We had a real conflict zone in the middle of this American National Park. Week three, they tried normal, well-known methods of reconciliation and, 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 and all the standard uh, techniques, none of which worked. Week four, they, without telling the kids what they were doing, they created a series of problems that the two groups could only solve by working together. For instance, there was a coach taking them, a bus taking them to some, uh, some activity, and the driver accidentally on purpose drove the coach into a ditch. So it was only with the 20 kids heaving together that they were able to get out. By the, within days of they were such good friends that they were buying treats for one another and so on. And somehow or other, that robber's cave experiment seems to me to be the real kernel of the human condition. If we can see ourselves as faced with a common problem that we can only solve by working together, we can actually transcend our differences. And that, I think, Georgette, is what you've shown through Syria and Israel, NGOs working together with the refugees. It is what you have shown through so many years of extraordinary work. And we thank you and ask you to give us a final word of hope. <laughs> thank you. Well, the final, the final word of hope is really a call to action. And here's my call to you. We have um, students here in this room. We have faculty members here in this room. We have members of the broader community here in this room. We have Christians, Jews, Muslims here in this room. And my call to action is please come back to me with some project, with some effort that you will make on behalf of your fellow human beings who are suffering terribly, whatever you can do, hold a party with a purpose to raise some money, do a clothing drive. I can tell you it's very cold and windy in Zatari refugee camp. Learn something about the crisis and pick one doable piece of it to address. Do it together. And then my second call to action is you've heard about an extraordinary development in which sworn enemies have been able to rise above politics and rise above stereotypes to come together. In your thoughts and in your conversations with the people in your world, support and nurture that process. Thank you very much to all of you, and thank you to you.